All right, in this video, I'm going to run through the definition of temperature, talk a little bit how, about how it relates to Maxwell-Boltzmann distributions, and then go through what we mean by absolute zero. So first of all, temperature is a measure of the average velocity of the particles. Keeping in mind that matter is made up of more particles than you can imagine, just so many, so many particles, they're all moving at different speeds. But if somehow we we're able to put a you know, police radar gun on each particle individually and measure its speed, and then we we're able to take all of those measurements and find an average with them, then what we would find is the average temperature increases as temperature increases. This does not mean that every particle in that matter is going faster when the temperature is higher. It's the average. So some particles will be going faster than the average. Some particles will be going slower than the average. We can't take the temperature and say, and so the particles in that matter are going at 14,000 meters per second. What we can say is, if we, can if we know what the temperature is, we know if we add them all up what we would eventually get. The um, individual particles can be going faster or slower than that. So how do we represent what is really going on with the particles? Well, that's where the Maxwell-Boltzmann distribution comes in. What that does is you can think of this as a probability distribution. So what is the probability of a particle moving at a specific speed? Okay. The general shape for this distribution looks like this. It's sort of lopsided to the right, where the right seems to stick out a little bit more than the left-hand side. And the average speed would sit somewhere like this. Okay. So what that means is, whatever this velocity is, there are approximately this percentage of the particles would have that velocity. If you added up all of these probabilities, you'd get up to 100%, or you'd include all of your particles. But in the meantime, this percentage of particles, whatever this works out to out of the total here, would be particles with a speed greater than v naught. So let's say that this works out to about 15% of this overall curve. That means if you took one particle out of the substance and you measured its speed, it would have a 15% chance of being going faster than v naught. And let's say then a resulting 85% chance of going lower than V0. This is at some temperature that we'll call T1. So how would this change if we went up to T2, where T2 is greater than T1? Well, what happens here is it's not like this whole curve shifts in a horizontal translation exactly. What happens instead is it's kind of like it just stretches out. So if this is the old curve, we'll call that one T1, and then let's put T2 on in a different color. So let's make T2 the red ones. What that means then is that it sort of shifts a little bit more to the higher velocities. See, for T2, the average velocity would be somewhere around here in comparison to T1's average velocity, which would be down here. What that means is, overall, the particles are on average going a little bit faster. But more than that, if we pick some arbitrary velocity, V0, and here we said that maybe 5% of the T1 particles are going faster than V0. When we raise the temperature, we increase the probability that a particle will have that minimum temperature, 15% or something like that. 
This is all really related to chemical reactions because it's really highly related to whether or not the chemical reaction will happen if particles have the minimum amount of energy and all that kind of stuff. But for now, we're just getting into the basic definition. So how do we measure temperature? Well, the simplest thing that was done uh, in the past is that a test tube containing a material that expands a lot when, uh, when it's exposed to higher temperatures, keeping in mind that if temperature is the motion of the particles, then the higher the temperature, the more motion of the particles. And we all know if we're moving around faster, we're going to try and occupy more space. So that's why, in general, um, matter expands when it's heated. So what was done originally is mercury was put in a test tube. And, the, and then it was put in ice water. Ice water was used because it gives us a nice predictable temperature. Because temperature doesn't change as state changes happen, then when we put ice and water together and we leave it for a period of time, it's going to come to exactly zero degrees Celsius. The mercury was then allowed to contract or expand depending on where it was before, and the, the level of the mercury was measured. They called that zero degrees Celsius. The same test tube of mercury was then placed in boiling water. And again, boiling water is a nice idea. Um, this is zero degrees C, so this is going to be 100 degrees C. And it's a nice idea because, again, the state change of water will make the temperature of water when it's boiling stable throughout the boiling process. This would have caused the mercury to expand up to some higher level. Here's where we marked our zero degrees in the last one. And so here we'll mark 100 degrees. Mercury was used because it expands a lot as far as, you know, liquids go um, when there's a big temperature change. So it was a nice um, material to use in that case. So now what we've got is a expansion measure that shows us where 0 degrees Celsius and where 100 degrees Celsius is. And if we want to make gradations in between, then we can figure out more accurately exactly what the temperature is. This is how Celsius first measured temperature and gave us the Celsius scale, where 0 degrees was set to the freezing point of water. And 100 degrees was set to the boiling point, and everybody else or every other temperature was set relative to those two amounts. Later, when we started to really think about this, though, we came up with another idea that zero degrees set by Celsius based on the freezing point of water, while useful, was sort of an arbitrary number to set as zero. If we think of temperature as the motion of particles, then presumably there should be a temperature where you should be able to go backwards to lower and lower temperatures where the particles move slower and slower and slower. And if we get to a low enough temperature, the particles should eventually stop. So if we're going to say that temperature is related to the speed of the particles, and we've set an arbitrary number for zero degrees C, and then we find all of these relationships between temperature and average speed, then we should be able to trace that backwards until the average speed goes to zero. And when that happens, we should hit some very minimum temperature that is possible. Now the truth is we weren't able to get the dots in this region. We can only get the dots in this region for a long time but we could use, see that there were a straight line and trace that straight line back. And when we did that, we came up with the temperature at which the average speed of the particles is zero, or the particles are stopped, was negative 273 degrees Celsius. So Kelvin made the decision to reset the temperature scale so that the temperature in Kelvin would be equal to the temperature in Celsius plus 273 degrees. What that did 
was it kept the size of a degree the same, but it reset it so that now temperature equals zero corresponded with absolute zero. Or the temperature where the particles stop. Now that was useful because since you can't go any slower than being stopped, what it means was there's no such thing as negative temperatures anymore. So that's what temperature is, how it relates to the actual distribution of the particles, and uh, the definition of absolute zero.